You're listening to Season 7 of Mobile Suit Breakdown, a weekly podcast covering the entirety of sci-fi mega-franchise Mobile Suit Gundam, researching its influences, examining its themes, and discussing how each piece of the Gundam canon fits within the changing context in Japan and the world, from 1979 to today. This is episode 7.7 of Meitzer and Men, and we are your hosts. I'm Tom, a lifelong Gundam fan, and whatever you think of F91, you can't deny that it's chock full of fun background details, like a cameo by Tomino at the Thanksgiving festival, or how the Tess's Bread logo has a sneaky little mustache in it. And I'm Nina, new to F91 and reaching that point in the podcast where I'm no longer certain how exactly I feel about this movie. Mobile Suit Breakdown is made possible by the support of 700 patrons and subscribers. Thank you all, and special thanks to our newest supporters. Red Davidson, Ketchup Rat, Adrian G.E., Preston F., Dr. Beanstalk, Michael D., Glenn N., Killian D., and Heartlight. You keep us genki. A couple of people have asked for a progress report on the pins and the contest. I'll be honest, we haven't made much progress on either yet. On top of regular podcasting duties and the usual crush of of end-of-the-year work and social commitments, I am helping throw a party for my calligraphy teacher's 100th birthday. (laughs) And uh, that's been taking up a lot of my spare time. But the party is this weekend, so once I'm on the other side of it, I'll have a lot more time to work on contest entries. We've also got help coming in next week to get the pins packaged and ready for shipping. The current plan is to mail them in early January. And I'm working on setting up a system for reviewing and voting on the contest entries, but it's not ready for the limelight yet. Kind of hard to make a bracket with 80 some odd entries in it. (laughs) Right. We've got another all-research episode for you. This week, Nina untangles the history of Ayatori, or Cat's Cradle, and other similar string games around the world, and I revisit ancient Babylonia with an eye to figuring out what about that long-deceased civilization might have been so appealing to the Rona family. Before that, let's continue our steady march through the cast of this movie. This week, the refugee kids from Frontier 4. Many from this group would go on to bigger and better roles in other Gundam projects. Orikasa Ai, who played rocker girl Dorothy, made her Gundam debut back in 0080 as Al's mother Michiko, but would return in Victory and in Wing. She also had major roles on Sakura Wars and Tenchi Muyo, singing theme songs for both franchises. Incidentally, Dorothy's full character name is Dorothy Mua, often translated as Dorothy Moore, possibly a reference to American blues and gospel singer Dorothy Moore, who hit it big in the 70s and was enjoying a career resurgence around the time of the movie's production. There are other Gundam women named for American singers coming up in the near future, so this may be the earliest example of that trend. The baby Hein Kochen was voiced, in his occasional pre-vocal gurglings, by another 0080 alum, Yoshida Konami. She played Dorothy in 0080, as well as Umi on Magic Knight Ray Earth and Hana Hatsuno on Gao Gai Gar. Migen Maojin, mostly notable for having his food stolen by an older boy, was voiced on the side by Kojiro Chie, mainly the voice of Anna Marie. Bertuo Rodriguez, the older boy who steals Hein's food, almost kills the baby by putting it into a spacesuit without any oxygen, and almost kills Cosmo and Birgit by spilling a crate of ammunition on the uneven deck of the space arc, was played by Ikura Kazue. She had just finished up a long stint as the main character of City Hunter, and was settling in to play Mora Basht over on 0083 Stardust Memory. Previously, she played grumpy neo Zeon ace Rezin Schneider in Shara's Counterattack, and in a few years, she's going to reunite with Orikasa on Sakura Wars. Leah, the young girl who, in the manner of many older sisters, ends up doing a lot of the work of taking care of the other little kids, was voiced by Kobayashi Yuko. Kobayashi is another one with upcoming roles on both 0083 and Victory, and she would later snag a seriously major role on Tenchi Muyo, playing opposite Orikasa in that franchise's many iterations. 
Bloodthirsty jumpsuit aficionado Sam Erg was played by Takato Yasuhiro, who went on to voice Gluttony in the original version of Full Metal Alchemist and Artemis in Sailor Moon. He would also come back for another The Friend Who Is Definitely Also There kind of role on Gundam Seed. George Azuma, another friend of Seabooks who is absolutely definitely present at several points throughout the movie, was voiced by Nishimura Tomohiro. He's played a lot of these kinds of filler roles, but he did land significant parts on Macross Plus and Macross 7, Samurai Troopers, and Anpanman. In the late 80s and early 90s, though, he was getting steady work voicing the male protagonist of hugely influential erotic horror series Urotsuki Doji. Arthur, whose last name is Young but has no relationship to museum curator Roy Young, because this movie is just like that sometimes, was played by Matsuno Taiki. Like Shio Yayoku, Birgit's voice actor, Matsuno debuted as a child, voicing the titular character in the 1978 adaptation of The Little Prince when he was just 10 years old. He would go on to voice the lead character in long-running mystery show The Kendaichi Case Files, and he would play Shurikenger on the tokusatsu show Ninpu Sentai Hurricaneger. Finally, Koyasu Takehito, voice of the seems like he was probably meant to turn into Seabook's rival Dwight Camry, is the big star from this group. He'd only just debuted a few years earlier, but by the time F91 came out, he was already making a name for himself as Snufkin in the 1990s Moomin anime, which was popular enough to touch off a craze for Moomin merch throughout Japan. He would play antagonist slash rival type characters in Gundam Wing and Gundam Seed, and Tomino himself would bring Koyasu back for similar roles in King Gainer and Turn A Gundam. I could probably spend all day listing his other major anime roles, but I would be remiss if I didn't also point out that he was Dio Brando in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, Ryosuke Takahashi in Initial D, and that he reunited with Orikasa and Kobayashi for Tenchi Muyo. And because I mentioned it in passing last week, he also played a major role in the anime adaptation of Clamp's Tokyo Babylon. And now Nina's research on Ayatori string games. It's Ayatori in Japanese, Cat's Cradle in contemporary English, but in the scholarship they call them string games. A piece of string, ends tied together to form a closed loop, is wrapped around wrists or hands, then twisted, pulled, and hooked around fingers, wrists, and in some notable cases, toes, to form abstract figures. String games are found all over the world, in the cultures of the Aleutian Islanders, the Inuit, the Torres Straits people, Native American tribes such as the Omaha, Chippewa, Osage, Diné, and Apache, First Nations people in what are now Canada and Australia, Native people of Guyana, Maori people, the Native people of Hawaii, and all over the South Pacific, really, the Philippines, China, Japan, Ireland, in Africa among the Ujiji, Batwa, Yoruba, and others, in Peru, in the Caribbean. And based on what's known about it so far, string games did not originate in any one or any small number of places. They developed organically and spontaneously in cultures all around the world. It is, in fact, the kind of game so old, we don't know how old it is. Sources can point to the earliest use of the term cat's cradle in an English text, 1768, or to a woodblock print depicting girls playing Ayatori, dated 1765. There are also written records of Ayatori from earlier in the Edo period, in the 1600s, by author, playwright, and poet Ihara Saikaku, but the game itself clearly predates these records. Possibly because of the symbolism of string in Japan, i.e. the thread of fate connecting two or more people, it crops up in a few different prints, including one I found from 1804 by artist Eishosai Choki, depicting the lovers Okiku and Yusuke playing. It is used as part of the storytelling traditions of several cultures. For example, Navajo string games are only played in the wintertime, and the figures are associated with or depict specific characters, spirits, and events, with accompanying stories. In some other traditions, string games were not simply games for children, but were used for divination and fortune-telling by shamans. 
One of the theories or speculations about the origin of string games is that they came out of the use of knotted cords for keeping records, before the advent of writing systems. If that were the case, string games would go back at least to 500 BC, and very likely earlier. What scholarship there is on the subject is very niche and very enthusiastic, but is less interested in tracing the history than in preservation, collection, and sharing the various forms and figures of the game from around the world. After all, until comparatively recently, why would anyone ever write down instructions for string games? Even without the storytelling aspect, these games would have mostly had an unbroken chain of transmission, with young children learning by watching, listening, and playing with parents and older children, then going on to teach others themselves. That Monica taught Reese the game is quite traditional. Many string games can be played solo or in versus mode. Alone, the player attempts to smoothly transition between different figures without dropping the string or having the whole thing collapse. And competitively, players alternate. One player takes hold of and manipulates the string figure held by the other player, transferring it to their own hands and changing it to a new form in the process. A player loses when they mess up the transition and cause the whole thing to fall apart, or when they make a form that is a dead end with no possible move for the other player. In Ayatori, the figures include ones like Mountain, Mount Fuji, the sun appearing between mountains, Rice Paddy, Small Rice Paddy, River, Silver Stream, Diamond, Seven Diamonds, and Mr. Moon. Some are related to astronomy, like Star, Hawaiian Star, Shooting Star, Milky Way, Subaru, which I didn't know this, it's a reference to the hairy head constellation in Chinese astronomy, which is the same or very similar to the Pleiades or Seven Sisters constellation. Others depict animals, moth, butterfly, dog with big ears, the fox and the whale, turtle, spider's web, frog, grasshopper, or objects, ladder, and variations with different numbers of rungs, I saw everything from single rung ladder to ten rung ladder, broom, witch's broom, two-ended broom, net, hand drum, folding fan, fortune slip, the omikuji, sake cup, bow and arrow, eraser, hamburger, boat, and airplane. And some are structures, Tokyo Tower, Iron Bridge, Rope Bridge, and stage. From the names, it's obvious that the game has evolved over time, with either modern names applied to old figures, for instance, hamburger <laughs> appears to be the same as frog, or new figures invented to represent new places, ideas, or technology, as in Tokyo Tower, Iron Bridge, and Airplane. On top of that, names and forms can vary even within Japan, a form might be the same but with a different name, or forms with the same name might vary a bit in their shape or their method. In the movie, Reese calls the form she demonstrates Hachikake Tsuribashi, or Eight Column Rope Bridge. None of my sources mentioned it, and the only bridge forms I found were the plain Rope Bridge, which is extremely simple, or the Iron Bridge, which is quite complex, and neither look like Reese's finished construction. Hers looks sort of like a more complex version of the rope bridge, like how the ladder form can have more and more rungs, but I couldn't find evidence that it exists as a real string figure, or even that it's actually possible. <laughs> Hilariously, when I searched Ayatori and Hachikake Tsuribashi, there was a link on the first page of results to a post on Yahoo Japan where someone is asking, in Japanese, whether the Hachikake Tsuribashi is a real Ayatori form or something the creators made up. And the only response amounts to, I don't know, I've never heard of it and can't find it anywhere. I even looked through drawings of forms from other places and didn't find anything that looked quite right. If somehow one of you out there listening knows that it's a real, executable form, please let us know. Otherwise, I think the creators made it up. There's another possible influence on Reese's Ayatori Eight Column Rope Bridge. Ayatori Hashi, or the Ayatori Bridge, which is a pedestrian bridge in Yamanaka Onsen, a hot spring town near Kaga City in Ishikawa Prefecture. 
It's a fairly simple steel bridge. Three trusses, wooden planks for a walkway, metal handrails, except that it curves and undulates its way over the Daishoji River. It's 94.7 meters long with a 1.5 meter wide walkway and a difference in elevation from one bank to the other of five meters. Doesn't sound like that big a deal, right? But it was designed by Teshigahara Hiroshi, the third Yamoto or head of the Sogetsu School of Ikebana Flower Arranging, who, if I understand the bio correctly, lives in Yamanaka Onsen. And it is quite visually striking to see. It's considered unusual for its S-curve shape, its dedicated pedestrian use, and its wine-red paint. Plus, it was built in 1991 and bears a strong resemblance to Reese's eight-column rope bridge, the red color, the zigzagging lines that render each side a series of triangle shapes. Although Yamanaka Onsen is not anywhere near Tokyo and the Sunrise Studios, the ceremony marking the completion of the bridge did appear in a movie, one directed by Teshigahara Hiroshi, yes, the same guy, who sounds as though he was a bit of a renaissance man. His bio also lists him as a potter, opera performer, and set designer for theater and dance. And ever since the Ayatori Bridge was completed, it has seen heavy use, as the onsen town is a popular tourist destination for Japanese as well as foreign tourists. We'll probably never know exactly what the thought process was behind Reese's eight-column rope bridge, but I love thinking about these possible connections. Not to mention what the game says about Reese and Monica's relationship, and could the Ikebana connection be more involved? There is a lot of flower symbolism in this movie, and what if one of the animators was studying flowers? And now, part two of Tom's research on ancient Babylon, this week on arts and culture. Last week, I gave you a rapid-fire version of Babylonian history, from before the founding of Babylon itself up through to the conquest by the Persian king Cyrus the Great, the incorporation of Babylon into the Hellenic world by Alexander the Great in 331 BC, and then its decline into obscurity in the shadow of nearby Tesiphon under the Parthian and then Sasanian empires. If that all left your head spinning, I can't blame you. We covered something like 4,000 years of history in a bit less than 30 minutes. That's like two years per second. Today we'll slow down to talk about culture, society, art, and myth. And I want to open with a quote from the introduction to A History of Babylon by Paul Alain Beaulieu. The name Babylon still evokes ambivalent images symbol of corruption and depravity in the Judeo-Christian tradition, depicted in the Bible as arrogant imperial city, home to ruthless despots and doomed to destruction by the prophets of Israel. Babylon never fully reclaimed in the modern perception her legitimate status as one of the longest lived and intellectually most creative civilizations of the ancient world. Indeed, if Babylon still casts its long shadow over our lives, it is not solely as epitome of moral decadence. Fundamental elements of time reckoning, such as the division of the hour into 60 minutes and the minute into 60 seconds, ultimately originate in the Babylonian sexagesimal system, which used a base 60 rather than the base 10 of our decimal system. The same Babylonian methods still survive in the division of the circle into 360 degrees. Many essential features of astrology, such as the practice of casting horoscopes and the division of the zodiac into 12 signs, began with the scientific and religious speculations of Babylonian astronomers. One must count as the most enduring contribution of Babylon to world civilization, the development of an elaborate predictive mathematical astronomy, which ranks as the earliest documented science in history. But reconstructing the civilization is a Herculean, or maybe I ought to say Gilgameshian feat. The civilization is gone. What remains of its material culture is buried under the soil and sand in Iraq. Those historians of earlier eras who wrote of it, like the Greeks Herodotus or Theseus, were writing more than a century after the Persian conquest of Babylon, and much of what they recorded was just legends, which have now been contradicted by rediscovered cuneiform records. Those records themselves are fragmentary, almost always literally so in the sense that they are fragments of broken tablets, 
but also in the sense that they record only what scribes or those who employed them chose to record, and only what happened to be preserved. It was a regular practice to clear out archives by destroying old records after so many years or so many generations. After all, clay tablets take up a lot of space, and who really needs a report from some long-dead local official about the status of his sesame crop, or a complaint about substandard ingots, that was duly resolved centuries ago? And many, probably most, of these tablets were left as soft, unfired clay so that they could be erased and used again. Ironically, much of what modern archaeologists have been able to recover was only preserved because the archive itself was destroyed and abandoned before it could be cleared out, or because the discarded tablets were reused as fill for construction projects. But even so, there's a lot we can learn about life in ancient Mesopotamia from these surviving records. The scribes of Sumer and Akkad took their writing seriously, and they kept records about all kinds of things. They also recorded their myths, they wrote laws, philosophical essays, social satires, and recipes for goat and garlic stew. Then of course there's the art. Modern museums are stuffed with pieces of Babylonian art, mostly excavated during the last two centuries. In the mid-19th century, Europe was gripped by a fever for antiquities, for the collection and study of the physical remains left by the civilizations of the past. By this point, Many of the most famous European sites were already being studied. Excavations at Stonehenge started in the 1600s, Pompeii in the 1700s, and in America, Thomas Jefferson excavated Native American burial mounds in the late 1700s, and in Africa, Napoleon's Egyptian expedition included a coterie of scientists who rediscovered, among countless other artifacts, the famous Rosetta Stone. But through all of this, Babylonia remained out of reach tucked away in a remote sector of the Ottoman Empire. But as the Ottoman state weakened, agents representing the interests of the rising European empires, the French, the British, the Germans, all began to penetrate deeper into Ottoman territory. By the 1790s, the British East India Company had agents in Baghdad, only 50 or so miles from the ancient site of Babylon. In 1811, one such agent, Claudius Rich, began excavations at the site of the city itself. More Europeans would follow, with excavations, some authorized, some illicit, conducted through the 1800s. These excavations did uncover huge numbers of artifacts, and laid the groundwork for just about everything we know of Babylonia today, but they were also reckless, all too often overzealous, hasty, and greedy. Looting and black market sales were routine. Artifacts were removed without properly documenting the context in which they were discovered, pieces were broken up so that they could be moved or sold. In one incident, hundreds of crates were lost when the ship carrying them was attacked by pirates. And countless artifacts were hauled back to Europe to serve as impressive curios, filling out personal and national collections. All of that is to say that when we try to understand what Babylon was like, we're working from fragmentary sources that have been fragmented yet further by the very process of trying to study them. When you add in the 4,000-year-long history and all the different ethnic groups with their own distinct cultures that rose and declined during the Babylonian period, it's a bit like taking a hundred different Lego sets, smashing them all together, letting a dozen five-year-olds play with them for an hour, burying half of the pieces in the backyard, and then trying to identify the original kits, based on just a couple of handfuls of pieces. But hey, let's try anyway. Babylonia lies in the southwestern extreme of the Fertile Crescent, that strip of arable land which runs up along the Mediterranean coast from Palestine through Syria until it reaches the Taurus Mountains that separate Anatolia from the Middle East, then down along the length of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers as they run on their roughly parallel course southwest to the Persian Gulf. The cities of ancient Sumer are in the far south, amid the reed-choked marshes and mudflats where the rivers merge just before emptying into the sea. Uruk, Lagash, Susa, and on the coast itself, Ur and Eridu. A little further north, the gap between the two rivers abruptly narrows. This was the region known to the Babylonians as Akkad. It's where you'll find Babylon itself, along with Sippar, Kish, later Tesaphon, and, much later, Baghdad. Further north still, the rivers grow further apart, and the land grows drier, giving way to arid plains and deserts. The rivers run through narrow valleys, sharing little of their water with the surrounding land. Following the Tigris north into these lands, you will eventually reach Assyria, its ancient capital of Assur, and its once impregnable stronghold at Nineveh. 
Follow the Euphrates west instead, and you'll reach Mari, on the modern border between Syria and Iraq. Life in Mesopotamia was defined by those rivers. As with the Nile in Egypt, the rivers delivered the fertile soil and the water that made agriculture possible. The region never received enough rain to sustain dry farming, so the water delivered by the Tigris and Euphrates was absolutely essential for any agricultural civilization to survive. In the Babylonian era, the two rivers ran closer together than they do now, creating a small, unstable, but very rich strip of habitable land. But the rivers were also fickle. A dry year could starve the crops. In the south, where the rivers ran shallow, a flood could cause the river to jump its banks, destroying harvests or entire cities. A really bad one could even change the courses of the rivers themselves, an apocalyptic event for a civilization like this. It's no surprise that surviving portions of the Sumerian creation myth open with the gods sending a flood to destroy mankind. Enki, god of the waters, warns a local king, known by different names in different versions, Zeusudra, Atrahasis, Utnapishtim, and he tells the king to build a giant boat to preserve himself and some few others. From the very beginning, the Mesopotamian civilizations sought to tame the rivers through irrigation, canals, dams. But even the smallest of these constituted a massive public works project, and as the civilizations grew larger and more complex, as they expanded to farm more land more intensively to feed more people, the scope of their irrigation projects had to expand as well. Vast armies of laborers were needed, along with skilled craftsmen, architects, administrators, and those workers all needed to be fed and clothed. Once built, the canals and dams needed to be protected, maintained, and periodically rebuilt. Moreover, irrigation is fundamentally a redistribution of a precious resource, one that is theoretically owned by no one, but which must, per force, be allocated somehow to someone. If rival cities clashed over water, say, if an upriver city redirected too much water to its own fields during a bad year, well, war was one natural response. But even within the realm of a single king, disputes over who got how much water and when and how were major issues that needed to be dealt with by the state, by some government apparatus. So all of this demanded a highly organized state apparatus, one that could mobilize huge numbers of people and vast resources. One that could collect food and other vital resources, in the form of taxes, and redistribute it in order to keep the vital organs of the society functioning. By the time our story starts, the relationship between the people and the canals had already become inseparable. The civilization was just too large to survive without irrigation. The irrigation was too vast and complex to survive without a populous and organized civilization. And I think you can see this tension in a story that is told about Ashnan, goddess of grain, and her brother Lahar, god of sheep and cattle. Both were created so that they could feed and clothe the Anunnaki, the children of the sky god An. But the divine Anunnaki didn't know how to turn fleece into wool or make clothing. They didn't know how to harvest grain and bake bread. They ran naked in the fields, eating grass like animals. Thus, humans had to be invented in order to make use of the abundance that was created by Ashnan and Lahar. Or, to put it another way, mankind could only exist thanks to the grain and the herds gifted to them by the gods, but it was only through human ingenuity and labor that those abundant raw materials could be transformed into things of real value. The foundational responsibility of any Babylonian king was, ultimately, to keep the water flowing and the food growing. Everything else, war, diplomacy, internal politics, even religion, was a means to that singular end. As the flood myth I mentioned earlier reveals, natural disasters were seen as the work of the gods, and it was the king's responsibility to keep the gods happy. In the first instance, to prevent disasters from happening in the first place, or, if that was impossible, then to work on behalf of the city's tutelary gods in order to keep the people safe. From their earliest stages, the cities of Sumer were built around temples, and the priests seem to have been their first rulers. Even after the king emerged as a separate political institution above the priests, he remained intimately entangled with the business of the gods. 
One of the Sumerian words used for these early kings was ensi, the title for an intendant or an administrator on someone else's property. Whatever power they wielded over their subjects, and that power was basically absolute, they were still just middle managers, serving at the whims of a distant master. But it would be inaccurate to think of Babylonian civilization as purely made up of the cities, full of scribes, merchants, artisans, priests, and kings, as well as the farmers who fed them. These early agriculturalists lived alongside semi-nomadic sheep and goat herding tribes, as well as fishing cultures coming up from the Persian Gulf Coast. And the boundaries between these groups weren't firm. The Amorites migrated into Babylonia from the west largely as nomadic herders, but in time many settled in villages and took up farming. If a harvest was bad, the villagers might pack up and take to the trails. And it wasn't long before there were Amorites living in the cities, and then Amorite kings ruling the cities. We even have records of an incident where one young king, being descended from an Amorite family himself and bearing an Amorite name, was nonetheless scolded by his father for not bothering to learn how to speak Amorite. But encounters between these groups were not always peaceful. Those Amorite kings did not simply slip on a patch of sesame oil and land on the throne in some crazy random mix-up. The history of Babylonia is a history of conflict between the settled peoples and new arrivals. These invasions, like natural disasters, were a part of the hostile world that existed beyond the city walls, and it was the king's responsibility to keep them at bay. When he failed, it was a sign that he had lost the gods' favor. I think you can see in the Mesopotamian world I'm describing a pretty good analogy for the universal century. Haha, <laughs> that's right, this is still a Gundam podcast. The space colonies are like the city-states of ancient Mesopotamia. Each one is a precariously balanced ecosystem, an oasis of habitable land surrounded by a vast, deadly void. Space, or the desert, is not hostile, it has no maliciousness to it, but it is always pressing in on your world. Life is only possible so long as it can be kept at bay, and that requires constant effort, all overseen by a highly organized apparatus. If canals need to be maintained, protected, and rebuilt, so do colony cylinders. I suspect that Mitzer Rona would be nodding along right now, if he were listening. During his conversation with Cecily after the Federation attack that nearly destroys the Rona Palace, they both seem preoccupied with the precarity of life in the colonies. At any moment, a beam could burst up through the floor beneath their feet and vaporize them both without warning. But it need not be a beam, an asteroid, or a bit of space junk could destroy the colony just as easily. Indeed, the attack by the Federation cruiser, at first, seems to be no more than just such a stray asteroid drifting too close to the colony. And in the quiet after the battle, Meitzer tells Cecily that humanity will never be able to return to the relative safety of Earth. They must learn to make their home in these fragile cylinders drifting among the stars. Forever. But as time goes on, as the work of maintaining this world becomes routine and fades invisibly into the background noise of life, people begin to forget just how close to the knife's edge they are. At the core of Cosmo-Babylonian ideology is the idea that ordinary people, left to their own devices, will follow what Iron Mask would probably call their animal impulses and rush headlong into their own annihilation. For humanity to survive, those passions must be restrained not through self-discipline, but externally, by the cosmo-aristocratic hierarchy. Their pitch is stability through control, control via coercion, and ultimately that coercion is just a proxy for the violence that they are willing to mete out on those who reject their new order. And in this respect as well, Meitzer found a good analog in Babylonia. Babylonian civilization was deeply hierarchical. The kings sat at the top of the social ziggurat, and below them the priests. Then the upper strata of commoners, wealthy merchants, captains of soldiers, business owners, astrologers, shipwrights, architects, scribes, private tutors. Then the lower classes were filled out with most of the laborers, farmers, construction workers, both general and specialized, artisans of all types, soldiers, sailors, chariot drivers, potters, brewers, tavern owners. Some certain skilled artisans, like jewelers, goldsmiths, perfume makers, and sex workers, straddled the two classes, 
as some members could be elevated into the upper classes in respect of their special skills, secret knowledge, or connections to a prominent patron. And below the lower class, there was the slave caste. But people of all sorts and professions could be enslaved for any number of different reasons, so there's no special set of professions or tasks that was relegated to enslaved labor. This social stratification was then enshrined in Babylonian law. The Code of Hammurabi is famous today for what is called the Lex Talionis, the Law of Retaliation, evocatively expressed as an eye for an eye. But in truth, the Code is somewhat more nuanced than that. In three separate articles, Hammurabi specified that, yes, if a man destroys the eye of another man, then his own eye shall also be destroyed. But if he destroys the eye of a man of the lower class, then he can get away with just some monetary compensation. And the same is true in other cases, especially for personal injury. The fees due to a physician for successful treatment are set according to the class of the patient, as are the punishments for malpractice. And I can still see Meitzer nodding eagerly along with all of this. He is trying to build a world where the law protects everyone, but does not do so equally. Now, this next connection between the two Babylonias is a little more of a stretch. Frankly, I think it's probably more likely to be a coincidence than intentional, but as I said last week, I am exactly as concerned with intentionality as Tomino himself is with historical accuracy, i.e., occasionally, and only when it suits me. He brought Babylonia into this story, so now I get to talk about chariots. Because you see, chariots were the mobile suits of their era, by which I mean they were the state of the art of military science, hugely complex and expensive war machines that, while relatively few in number, made all the difference on the field. There is some debate about who first invented the chariot and where, although a lot of that comes down to how strictly you define chariot. In Babylonia, though, there is evidence of some kind of wheeled, animal-drawn vehicle in military use from at least 2600 BC. The Standard of Ur, a mosaic-inlaid wooden box discovered in Ur and now in the collection of the British Museum, depicts a Sumerian army using a kind of proto-chariot that is really more of an angry cart. Sturdily built, with four solid wooden wheels, armored, drawn by a team of draft animals, four onagers probably rather than horses, each carried a driver, a spearman or javelin thrower, and a bundle of spare javelins. A mid-sized city-state in Sumer around that time, with a population in the low tens of thousands, might have been able to muster about a thousand infantry, who would have been mostly spearmen fighting phalanx style behind heavy shields, and some twenty chariots. Each chariot represented a huge investment for the state. Besides the specialized training needed to build, maintain, operate, and fight from such a vehicle, the actual materials in use were exceedingly precious. Draft animals were rare and valuable. We're talking here about a civilization that had access to cattle, but ate almost no beef because the beasts were way too valuable as work animals to even consider slaughtering one to eat it. But also, ancient Babylonia was desperately short of wood. Tellingly, in the epic named for him, the mythic king Gilgamesh and his companion Enkidu demonstrate their heroism by making the arduous journey all the way to Lebanon, where they find the sacred realm of the gods, a cedar forest. Defeating the guardian, they bring back enough wood to make a gate for the city of Nippur. And in reality, this shortage was an enduring problem, one with a lot of unexpected consequences. For one thing, Babylonian buildings had an unfortunate tendency to collapse, in large part because they were made from sun-baked clay bricks. Fire-hardened bricks were much stronger and were used for royal palaces or temples, but the fuel necessary to make them was just too expensive for ordinary buildings. So in that context, imagine the expense of fueling a chariot force. I passed over the training issue before, but we really shouldn't underestimate it. We know from surviving records that after horses were adopted as chariot-pulling animals, the breaking-in period necessary before a chariot horse could be considered battle-ready was, at a minimum, seven months. There is again some debate about how these early Sumerian chariots were used, with some suggesting that they were used as shock troops, charging toward enemy formations at full speed, modern experiments with recreations have shown that to be around 15 miles per hour, 
while the charioteers hurled javelins to soften up the defenders before crashing directly into them. Others argue that they were used more like modern infantry fighting vehicles, used to rapidly deliver troops to key spots on the battlefield or extract soldiers in a bad spot. Of course, they weren't just being used on the battlefield. Chariots were issued by the state and used by messengers and other officials. We have a fantastic letter from the early 1700s BC in which an official named Ila Salim complains that the chariot issued to him by the king has broken and he implores his lord for a replacement, ending the letter with, I will surely bring order to your lands. I am the servant of my lord. Please may my lord not withhold a chariot from me. Anyway, time and contact with other peoples forced the Sumerian chariot to evolve. Sargon's Akkadian army, around 2300 BC, was heavily focused on light troops armed with bows, and they savaged the short-range Sumerian javelin throwers. With greater range, power, and accuracy, the bow, especially the composite bow, which seems by this point to have been in use in the region, turned out to be a far more effective weapon for charioteers. Then around 1600 BC, two things happened. The Hittites smashed the Babylonian armies and sacked Babylon, and the Kassites arrived. The Hittites triumphed in part thanks to their technological edge. They had developed a secret method for producing iron in large quantities their rivals just couldn't match. And they had developed a lighter weight chariot, with two spoked wheels instead of four solid ones, capable of carrying three men instead of two. The Babylonians might not have been able to match them for iron, but they knew a good chariot when they saw one. At roughly the same time, the arrival of the Kassites seems to have coincided with the major introduction of the horse into Mesopotamia. We don't know much about the Kassites, but scholars have managed to identify a number of Kassite loanwords adopted into the Akkadian language, and almost all of them relate to horse breeding and chariotry. Suddenly, all of the elements were in place for the creation of a new state-of-the-art chariot, one that was smaller, lighter, more maneuverable, pulled by a more powerful team, and carrying more effective weapons. In other words, the mobile suits of the Cosmo-Babylonian era evolved in much the same way as the chariots of Mesopotamian Babylon and in response to many of the same pressures. Incidentally, there's a persistent rumor about the decision to shrink those late UC era mobile suits. The original Gundam was like 18 meters tall and up through Shars counterattack, the machines just kept getting bigger. The new is a full 23 meters but the F-91 itself is a puny 15 meters. You will sometimes hear people say that this is because there was a plastic shortage at the time, which made Bondi request smaller suits so they could save on materials when it came time to make the kits. I've never found any evidence for this purported plastic shortage, and according to a feature in the magazine Great Mechanics, the decision to downsize came from Tomino himself. And in fact, he wanted to go even more extreme, down to only 8 or 9 meters. It was Bondi that balked at the idea, afraid that the new, smaller kits wouldn't fit with the existing product lineup. They insisted on bigger machines. The parties settled on 15 meters as a compromise that would still look good on the shelf next to existing models. We know that these miniaturized mobile suits of Cosmo Babylonia were designed based on references from Babylonian art, at least before the director demanded his team slap some more medieval-looking armor on there but the specifics of what was taken from where and how it was used are harder to suss out. We know for certain that after abandoning the mono-eye, ubiquitous on Xeon designs, the wide, goggle-eyed look of mobile suits like the Denon Zan was inspired directly by the way eyes are represented in Babylonian sculpture. We know also that the designers were referencing art books or museum catalogs, and the British Museum is the only one specified by name in the accounts that I've read. I would love to be able to go through the British Museum's collection item by item to try to match examples to what's in the movie, but as of this writing, the British Museum's collection numbers some 159,998 artifacts. So let's just do some highlights. The first major, oh hey that's Babylonian, moment in the movie hits around 25 minutes in, when Cecily is in her very fancy bathtub. The tub is standing on clawed feet like those of a bird. The two we can see in front are both grasping orbs. Yet the tub itself is shaped like a boat and it has a distinctly human face on the front, with braided hair, a beard, and a circlet above vacant black pits where the eyes ought to be. 
We never get a good view of the sides of the tub, but I suspect that if we did, we'd see the outline of wings, because I think this is a corruption of the Lamasu, a human-headed, crowned, winged bull creature. Ironically, though, this famous depiction of the Lamasu is mostly an Assyrian innovation. Earlier Babylonian equivalents depict a winged or merely robed humanoid goddess called Lama. The feathered talons clutching orbs used for feet are a separate issue entirely, because again, this is a winged bull creature, they should be hooves, but we'll come back to those. Let's table them for the moment. A few minutes later, Cecily meets with her grandfather in a palatial throne room. The walls of the throne room are decorated with stone friezes. In fact, at one point, there is a very oddly composed shot where the camera pulls back to show Cecily standing directly in front of Meitzer. It's just her back, and she obscures his body almost completely, so the only points of visual interest in the shot are the sections of art visible on the wall behind Meitzer's throne. The central object above the throne is an empty circle, like the frame of a portrait, from which emanate a pair of broad feathered wings. It is flanked by two figures, both humanoid, but with the heads of eagles. Each carries a pail in one hand and lifts the other hand above its head, fingers curled as though holding an object. The figures are dressed in fringed robes and have surprisingly detailed musculature, especially in the calves and forearms. Reliefs in this model are actually quite common in Mesopotamian art, as it turns out. If depicted in full, we would see that the eagle-headed figures are also winged, a somewhat common depiction of a kind of demigod protector about whom we don't really know very much. The closest real-world match for this whole piece that I've been able to identify is a series of reliefs from the palace of the Assyrian king Ashur Nasirpal, who ruled from Nimrud. Now held in the British Museum, these panels depict winged figures, some eagle-headed, some not, in identical poses, carrying identical buckets, and often flanking winged discs, much like the one that appears in the movie. One such relief, albeit with winged but not eagle-headed figures, was placed right behind the royal throne, just exactly as the one in the movie is. But in this real-world relief that I think was used as the main inspiration, the central winged disc is not empty. Instead, it contains an image of a person, believed to be a representation of the god Ashur. The omission of this divine figure in the movie version is interesting, but it gets more interesting once you learn that the original plan for the story would have included a subplot about the Rona family creating their own new religion called something like Cosmo Cruz as a way to spread the teachings of Cosmo aristocracy. I don't know where they would have gone with that storyline, but including the winged disc representing the sun while removing the god usually depicted within feels like a conscious choice, one that might have been meaningful in some other version of this movie. Also missing from the movie's version of the relief, the birdmen's raised hands are empty, but in the real-world reliefs from which they originate, the figures are consistently shown holding a kind of pinecone-shaped object, which is described in contemporary texts as a purifier and possibly derived from a part of the date palm that was used by Mesopotamian farmers to artificially pollinate female date trees. F-91's version of the central solar disk has got what appears to be stylized legs on it, and those legs end in circles, in what could be another depiction of talons clasping orbs, just like the one on the bathtub. The wings also stretch far wider than they do on the Assyrian reliefs from Nimrud. Together, these elements actually make it look far more like the Persian Faravahar. Today, the Faravahar is a symbol of Zoroastrianism and of Persian culture generally, but it was probably originally adopted from these Mesopotamian civilizations, who themselves probably got it from the Egyptians, where it originated as a depiction of the god Horus. Then, at about 38 minutes into the movie, we see a pair of pretty seriously cute little zero-g worker machines painting a gigantic red eagle onto the shell of Frontier 4 in preparation for the big Cosmo Babylonia declaration a few days hence. That same symbol reappears at 55 minutes in when Seabook infiltrates the colony. Now they've got golden eagles on red banners with lots of gold fringe. On paper, that probably sounds pretty derivative of the golden eagle on red background from Shar's counterattack, but visually they have very different vibes. These Cosmo-Babylonian eagles, or falcons, are shown with their legs splayed. This makes them a close match for the Shabazz, 
the mythic guardian falcon of ancient Persian mythology, believed to have been depicted on the battle standards of Cyrus the Great. Remember Cyrus the Great? He was the founder of the Achaemenid dynasty, whose armies overthrew the Babylonian emperor Nabu Naid, and whose successors, still using the same golden falcon standard, relegated Babylon to permanent irrelevance. Even the gold fringe on Cosmo Babylonia's banners evokes our best modern guesses at how those ancient Persian flags might have looked. Ironically, then, of all the art and iconography on display in Cosmo Babylonia, very little of it is actually Babylonian. There are Assyrian reliefs in the palace and Persian birds on their flags. Meitzer's Babylon is made in the image of the real city's greatest enemies. I don't know if that was intentional, but either way, it's fascinating. One more quick hit before I go. Remember the Medzak? It's the mobile weapon that would have been Iron Mask's final machine instead of the Rafflesia, but it was cut because it was too cool. Mecha designer Ishigaki Jr. posted some of the original design drafts for it on Twitter, and I'm convinced that it is heavily based on the famous Queen of the Night relief dated to around 1800 BC and made somewhere in southern Mesopotamia. God, the one truly Babylonian thing in the movie, and they cut it. Anyway, I'll put some side-by-sides in the show notes so you can make a direct comparison yourself. Next time on episode 7.8, Artistic Temperaments, we continue our research and discussion of Gundam F-91 and OSHA violations. MSB, now available via Semaphore. Have we checked? Semaphore might be the name of some terrible new app. No, I, I literally mean flags. Makeover, 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 makeover. <laughs> Dramatic techno babble. The men who stare at goats. Gundam objective, always top sales like a dog without a horse. Office drama. And too many cooks spoil the stew, but so do too few cooks, or the right number of cooks, but they all hate each other and they're all cooking other stews on the side, but there's one cook who just wants to make pizza and another is worried the stew will get thrown out the kitchen window and another cook won't even go in the kitchen and... This is only the beginning. Mobile Suit Breakdown is written, recorded, and produced by us, Tom and Nina, in scenic New York City, within the ancestral and unceded land of the Lenape people, and made possible by listeners like you. The opening track is Wasp by Misha Dioxin. The closing music is Long Way Home by Spinning Ratio. The recap music is His Last Share of the Stars by Dr. Turtle. You can find links to the sources for our research, the music used in the episode, additional information about the Lenape people, and more in the show notes and on our website, GundamPodcast.com. You can get in touch with us on Twitter or Instagram at Gundam Podcast, or by email to hosts at GundamPodcast.com. And thank you for listening. With Gundam's international popularity on the rise, there are now more opportunities to share your wrong Gundam opinions than ever before. So get out there and tell some stranger that MSB has got to run out of wrong Gundam opinions soon. Surely there must be some limit to how wrong people can be about Gundam. And now, part two of Tom's research on ancient Babylon. This week on arts and culture. And chariots. Chariots are art and culture. So, haha, wow, I just remembered I know someone whose name is Monica Reese. Okay, moving on. What? No, I'm just listening to you. Okay. I'm enjoying it. Thanks. <laughs> Happy face, though. And what if one of the. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fade out? Yeah. Nice. It is quite a cool looking bridge. Also, I hadn't realized Sogetsu is not a very old school. Like, the lineage goes a ways back, but the Sogetsu school wasn't founded until the 20s. And it's rather avant-gardist as these things go. Mm -hmm. 
as one would expect of something founded in the 20s. Mm-hmm. By Paul Alain Boulay, Beaulieu. By Paul Alain Beaulieu, Boulieu. Beaulieu. Stupid French names. That might be the er wrong Gundam opinion. The wrongest of Gundam opinions. I know, there ought to be a law. We know for certain that after abandoning the mono eye ubiquitous on Zio Design. Zio. Gonna do music out, then record, squ- record scratch, and I'll come back. Yeah, yeah. I um, I remember at one point reading this thing about um, basically someone arguing against using CE and BCE because they were like, it's not any less Christian centric to take the Christian era and call it common era. Especially when there's like a different Hebrew time scale and Japan and China have their own year marking. Right. Like, it's not actually the common era. It's the Christian era, it's and like common. pretending it isn't doesn't help anybody. 